Hello, and welcome to another episode of Book Drops. Uh, I am Don Boozer, the manager of the literature department here at Clean Public Library, as well as the coordinator for the Ohio Center for the Book. And I'm Sarah Flynn, the manager of the Popular Library. And we would like to uh, welcome you to our episode on uncommon narrators. And we will uh, give you a little bit of an idea what that is all about here in just a second. Um, I would like to remind everybody that the Ohio Center for the Book has a new podcast, uh, Page Count. And that is available anywhere uh, podcasts, uh, you listen to your podcast. Um, the current one, uh, Laura Maylene Walter talks to a literary agent from Ohio and uh, looks at some query letters and things like that. And if you're interested in possibly uh, getting a, a query letter or a first few pages of your, your novel uh, critiqued, um, go to ohiocenterforthebook.org and we have some information there about submitting those and uh, we might possibly use them in a future episode. So. Uh, We'll be interested to see what uh, people submit from that. So, uncommon narrators. So this sort of grew out of our conversation a few weeks ago, I think, about um, uh, you know, books with dogs as narrators or books with you know animals and that sort of thing. And then we found out there's, and a, we lot found out there's more. a lot more. <laughs> it's sort of like our, our novels in verse that we talked about uh, recently too. And this, uh, I will say that this uh, little Facebook thing we have going on here has really expanded my uh, you know, genres and things like that. You know, looking for topics, it's- And expanded Goodread. Exactly, exactly. TBR. Yeah, yeah ex exponentially my, my Goodreads uh, want to read uh, titles. And so we, we were talking just a little bit um, today before we started that um, the, the whole idea of, of the, the, the uncommon narrator, the, the non, let's say the, the non-human, mm -hmm. uh, well, not necessarily non-human, but the, the non, you know, because you have an interesting one in, in one of yours, as yeah, a matter of fact. Yeah. But um, it, it, it actually goes back quite a ways. I mean, we, I think we were even talking about, you know, Aesop's Fables has, you know, talking foxes and talking mm -hmm. birds and that sort of thing. So having the, um, the whole idea from a, a non-human perspective or, a, a, you know, an uncommon perspective is not really as odd as what I had originally thought, too, because mm -hmm. I think the, we had brought up a couple titles and it was just the fact that it's like, oh, there's like one or two, but then you start looking, like you said, it just, just expanded and this is just a tiny selection. And we have both inanimate objects and we have Which animals. I was surprised and... about, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I had to narrow mine down because I had about 12 books about dogs <laughs> being the narrator. And so I had to uh, and that, that, I think that, I think it's an interesting point too because I mean I think that I mean I would assume that there are a lot of and I, I was going to say cats I have actually there's, there's got cats cat too one. I've got a cat yep and so so I think that that people sort of imbue their pets with you know their own personality and I I am I am not a pet owner I will say that you know I will admit to that um, but I think that those of you who are pet owners I mean you definitely yeah. your, your pets are like your pets are people too so to speak. oh yeah and you know what they're feeling and you know what they like and they don't like. So you always so, translate. So, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a natural sort of outgrowth to, you know, sort of let some, 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 somebody, let's say somebody like that, you know, tell a story. Yeah. Um, but uh, I guess we can just uh, dive right into yeah. some of the ones that we have. If you would like to go first, feel free to uh, explore this area of sure. uncommon narrators. Um, I think I'm going to do Mr. Be Gone first by okay. Clive Barker. Uh, I love this cover and the pages are all kind of aged around ah. the edges, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and with the library book, I had to like check. I was like, is this like actual wear? But no, it's, it's really just made to be that way. Um, so this is narrated by a demon. And I didn't know Clive Barker. So I was reading about Clive Barker. And he also wrote Hellraiser and Candyman, yeah. which were both made into really popular horror movies. Yep. Um, but just I'll just do like the little intro because it makes me want to read this. Burn this book. Go on, quickly, while there's still time. Burn it. Don't look at another word. Did you hear me? Not one more word. Why are you waiting? It's not that difficult. Just stop reading and burn the book. It's for your own good. Believe me. No, I can't explain why. We don't have time for explanations. Every syllable that you let your eyes wander over gets you into more and more trouble. And when I say trouble, I mean things so terrifying your sanity won't hold up. Once you see them or feel them, you'll go mad, become a living blank, all that you ever were wiped away because you wouldn't do one simple thing. Burn this book. It doesn't matter if you spent your last dollar buying it. No, it doesn't matter if it was a gift from somebody you love. Believe me, friend, you should set fire to this book right now or you'll regret the consequences. 
<laughs> so that's on. Awesome. If that doesn't make you want to read it, then. that's awesome. And there's, I mean, with, with uh, starting with the demons too. I mean, look at look at even like like the Book of Revelation in the Bible is like a narrated by you know an angel showing you know him around you know heaven and things like that. And the uh, the one with um, uh, practical demon keeping, I believe, is one by Christopher Moore. Oh, it's been a while since I've read one. that yeah. one. And what's the one that was just made into a TV series or a, a mini series with um, um, the guy who used to play Doctor Who? Uh, no. Oh, oh, the Terry Pratchett. You know what I'm talking about, though. I know what you're talking yeah. about. Good Omens. Thank you. Good and Omens. That's a, yes, like an angel yes. and a exactly, demon. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, so the whole non-human, you know, narrator has been used for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So I think that that being able to like pull those those sort of tropes out and use them in a, in a more contemporary book is a really cool, really, really cool thing. Idea. So we, we go from demons to um, inanimate objects. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Tom Robbins, um, I was big into Tom Robbins for a while. Uh, I find his use of language just absolutely endearing. He can he can turn a phrase like, like no other person. Um, he's probably best known for the book, Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, which was made into a movie starring Uma Thurman. Mm -hmm. Um, which is about a hitchhiker with a giant thumb. So to give you an idea of the kind of things that we are talking about in a, in a Tom Robbins novel. So his, his novels are known for their, their really convoluted plot lines. Um, he has a soft spot for pagan mythology and pre-Christian religions and spirituality and that sort of thing. So he, he grows out of that whole 1960s, 1970s sort of zeitgeist, you know, with the counterculture and that sort of thing. Um, his novels are not for the faint of heart. You, you have to dig into them, and they are sometimes risque. So you might want to use the explicit uh, you know, language uh, you know, um, uh, label on there. But this book actually includes a whole team of inanimate objects. Um, there is uh, can of beans, dirty sock, spoon, painted stick, and conch shell. And they're, they're, I'm not going to get into why there's a team of inanimate objects in, in the book. But he does a really good job of, of making you care about these inanimate <laughs> objects, which I think is a sign of a good storyteller. Yeah. And just to give you an idea, I, I pulled out one little section here just to share with everybody to give you an idea. So, um, and I did find it interesting that uh, some of the uh, inanimate objects do have gender and some, one of them is uh, referred to as his slash her, or he slash him, uh, or he slash she uh, through the whole thing. So it's, it's, it's an interesting way to sort of, you know, bring out that, that as well. So, so this is, it says, I'll follow them, shouted can of beans. You yell for Mr. Stick. That proved unnecessary. Having heard the commotion, Painted Stick and Conch Shell had interrupted their celestial enterprises and were even then rushing into the cl little clearing. What's the trouble here? asked the shell. Her soft voice jackhammered with sobs, rubberized with hysteria. Spoon babbled a largely incoherent account of the emergency, but Painted Stick eventually got the picture. He took off in pursuit. Conch Shell and Spoon followed after. By that time, the porcupine had arrived at the creek bank. It stood there absentmindedly chewing, too narcotically blissed by the salty delicacy in its chops to invest much effort in either battle or retreat. Cannabines caught up with the animal, but had no idea what to do next. End over end, like a Chinese acrobat, Painted Stick flipped furiously along the forest path. He flipped directly up the porcupine, striking its nose with a resounding swack. The animal squealed with pain, dropped the sock, and wheeled dizzily around in two complete circles before scrambling up the trunk of, a near, of the nearest tall conifer. Help, screamed Dirty Sock from far away. And to his her horror, Cannabines realized that the porcupine's thrashing tail had swept the sock into the white waters of the stream. To make you care about, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the Dirty Sock running into the stream, really that's, not bad, that's not a bad storyteller. Yeah, that's really, really good. <laughs> so yeah, so, that's, uh, so Tom Robbins, if you haven't read Tom Robbins, I would, you know, at least, at least you know, give him a try. Like I said, not always politically correct, um, but again, keep, keep in mind the, uh, where he came out of. And uh, he's 89 years old now, I just found out. So um, living up in the Pacific Northwest, so. Um, I've got to do a dog one, so I like spread them out a little. So, um, and an awesome cover, uh, Dog On It by Spencer Quinn. And I pulled a little passage out. Um, Bernie parked on the street. A man got out of the big black car, came toward us. We got out too. The man was about Bernie's height, but not as broad. He had a goatee, which always caught my attention. And I was staring at it when he, his smell reached me. The very worst smell in the whole world, cat. The man in our driveway smelled of cat. It was all over him. I'm looking for Bernie Little, the man said. Some people, Susie Sanchez, for example, or Charlie, of course, had friendly voices. This man did not. 
present, said Bernie. A frown crossed this man's face. My name's Damon Kiefer, he said. I understand my ex-wife, without consulting me, hired you to look for my daughter, Madison. She hired us, yes, said Bernie. And, said Damon Kiefer, and what, Bernie said. Questions, questions. I had a question of my own. Was there a cat or maybe more than one in that black car? Not likely. Cats, unlike my guys, weren't big on riding around in cars. Another one of those bewildering things about them. What beat riding around in cars? Maybe a few things. I thought of that distant she bark not too long ago, but not many. Was it possible cats had no idea how to have fun? I didn't know. All I knew that was the chances of a cat being in the car were slim, but not none. And a cat in that black car meant a cat on our property. A cat on our property? I heard a powerful rumbling sound and had the vague impression it was coming from my own throat. The next thing I knew, I was on the move. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Very good. So from, so I suppose I, since uh, the, the cat's got the uh, short end of the uh, painted yeah. stick there, I will, uh, <laughs> Balance it out. yeah. So um, the, the one I, I wasn't able to get a hard copy of this one, but I was able to download it from our eBooks uh, at the library. So it, it, it's called, uh, I am a cat by the Japanese author Soseki Natsumi. And it, the whole idea of, uh, it sounded like much more contemporary thing, but I did a little, did a little bit more research and Soseki Natsumi uh, was a Japanese novelist, but he was born in 1867 and died in 1916. So he was not that old when he died, but he was a, he was a scholar of British literature. Uh, he wrote haiku, uh, fairy tales, and, and his face actually appeared on the uh, thousand yen note up until 2004. So a major, you know, major literary figure in, in Japan. And I had never heard of him. I felt, you know, a little ashamed of that. But, uh, um, but I, I will say, I'll give a shout out to uh, Michael Credico, uh, who is now on the staff of the literature department. And he, um, I asked him about the uncommon narrators and he immediately was like, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. I'm like, thank you very much. <laughs> so, so shout out to uh, Mr. Credico for that. Um, I also found out that the, that the author Saseki is um, a character in a video game. Um, the um, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney uh, video game. Yeah. Uh, there was a sequel to that one that he is. Uh, he appears in that one, and he actually appears in the sequel to the sequel. So uh, yeah. he, he's, uh, like I said, I, I felt bad about that. But the uh, the one that um, I pulled for this one is uh, it is literally called I'm a Cat, and that is the way that the uh, the book starts. So just to give you an idea of the uh, the style, and of course this would be in translation too. So it's, you got to keep that in mind mm -hmm. as well. So it's like I am a cat. As yet, I have no name. I have no idea where I was born. All I remember is that I was meowing in a dampish, dark place when, for the first time, I saw a human being. This human being, I heard afterwards, was a member of the most ferocious human species, a chausse, one of those students who, in return for board and lodging, performed small chores about the house. I hear that on occasion, this species catches boils and eats us. However, as at this time I lacked all knowledge of such creatures, I did not feel particularly frightened. I simply felt myself floating in the air as I was lifted up lightly on his palm. And when I accustomed myself to that position, I looked at his face. This must have been the very first time that I ever set eyes on a human being. The impression of oddity, which I then received, still remains today. First of all, the face that shouldn't be decorated with hair is as bald as a kettle. Since that day, I have met many a cat, but never have I come across such a deformity. The center of the face protrudes excessively, and sometimes from the holes in that travel... There we go, sorry. The vicissitudes of technology. Um, uh, do, 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 do. The center of the face protrudes excessively and sometimes from the holes in that protuberance, smoke comes out in little puffs. I was originally somewhat troubled by such exhalations for they made me choke, but I learned only recently that it was the smoke of burnt tobacco which humans like to breathe. <laughs> so I am a cat by Soseki Natsume. Um. I have a graphic novel yeah. and uh, called Laika, um, and this is by Nick Abadzis. Um, and I didn't have a chance to read this yet, but um, it was an Eisner Award winner, um, and it is about a stray dog in Russia that was sent up in Sputnik oh, 2. Oh, I thought the name sounded familiar. Yeah, right. so I started okay. reading about this. Oh my gosh. So. Um, one of the first animals in space, not the first animal, there were assorted bugs, monkey, um, a few other dogs. 
Um, but the first animal to orbit the Earth. Oh, well. So, and this was November 3rd, 1957. So it tells about um, finding them as a stray and then like going through like the program and- Oh, wow. You know, so it was kind of a sad story, but um, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> may I? You may. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, okay, yeah. Full color, incidentally. Oh, man. So I'm guessing Laika does not have that happy of a life. No, oh, not, man. not especially. So there was a lot of backlash later, and now there's statues ah, and um, okay. a lot more. Very cool. There. So this, this um, again, is, is one of those things where I think it's um, a nice way to really emphasize that um, just because it's a graphic novel doesn't mean it's, it's a kid's story. No, absolutely um, not. It is a uh, way to tell a nonfiction. It's a it's the, the way that comics can tell a nonfiction story just as well as it can tell a fiction story. Yeah. And so I think that, and we uh, read a couple of graphic novels for our, our book discussion group that um, we said that we, we probably would not have read like a regular prose um, about book about it. this topic. But that, you know, it's like, it's a way to suck people in. It might not normally, you know, read a book about. Right. Like Am I going to go pick up a, yeah. Yeah, a book about exactly. space exploration? Exactly. Yeah, there was a few panels. I was reading some Goodreads reviews of it, and somebody had posted a little panel, and I think it was in the training, and it's a picture. I don't know if it was, like, something that was spinning, and the dog was, like, laying there, like, after they opened it up. It's just, yep. like, so much more visual than just talking about it. Oh, man, man, man. Well, on a lighter note. <laughs> Please help. <laughs> I'm not sure what's lighter or not, <laughs> but I was. Um, I will bring up. We uh, we're going to talk about uh, both Watership Down and uh, then another book that. So I, I'll let you briefly uh, sort of set the stage because uh, people may have very well heard of Watership Down. Yeah, I think Watership Down is probably the most famous Ooh. one. I would think uh, was the one that first came to mind when we talked about this topic, and then um, by Richard Adams. And I realized as we were talking about it, that I thought I read it, but I think my mom read it to me, and Aww. I don't think I ever read it. Aww. I know, I remember that's, her reading this that's, to that's me. Like, that's like a self-audio uh, book, yeah. I know, I yeah. know. So um, I haven't had a chance to read it. Um, but um, narrated by Bunnies, and yeah. then has had a few adaptations, and then I was reading a little bit about Richard Adams, and he was telling, he made up the stories to tell his daughters. Uh, and then the daughters bugged him to write them down. And I read a little bit about the, um, you know, that of course he gets turned down everywhere for this book. And um, finally one really small, I think they only had like published one other book, picked him up and took a chance on it. And it did really well. And the rest is history. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a, a classic. Now, you know, one of you brought it today, it, it was a, it's a lot thicker than what I remember. Yeah, <laughs> and it, so it's, yeah. And I and I I'm a sucker for glossary, so there's a little rabbit, you know, language glossary in there and everything, and so it's a whole 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 constructed world about. There you know. is there was um I had was looking at the passages, but there were were actually a lot of words that were kind of unfamiliar. There was one word, and it meant kind of um, the bunnies higher in the hierarchy that uh -huh. you know were protectors, and so it, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, a the lot whole, to it. I, I like the fact whenever you take a book like that that you, the the author really does their work in trying to see the world through it's not the paradigm. That, exactly, yeah. exactly. Which brings me to The White Bone uh, by Barbara Gowdy, a uh, Canadian novelist. Um, this is basically, this has been actually compared to Watership Down with Elephants. So uh, same way with this, it's uh, very much from an elephant perspective. And the, um, I thought it's, 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 it really struck me with this one, and I haven't read the entire thing yet, but I, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be my Goodreads list, but, you know, we know what my we'll Goodreads see. list is like. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but um, there are footnotes. There's a number of footnotes. There is a map in the front. Uh, there are a whole mythology of that the, uh, the sun created the elephants and the moon created all the other animals, and, except for humans, and um, the whole idea of it, the, one of the footnotes talks about the way that uh, elephants will calculate the passage of time. And then it's saying, for the sake of simplicity, however, our minute, moment, and second are resorted to throughout this narrative, as is day and year. So it's like, you know, it's not, those aren't really elephant words, but, you know, you know we're going to use those to, like, get the point across. But the fact that there are footnotes and everything, I think, is just the coolest thing. Um, just to give you an idea of the sort of the, the, the tenor of it, it says, um, this is the prologue that actually is... Um, sort of sets the stage, but is not necessarily from the elephant's uh, perspective. 
So it says, you know, if they live long enough, they forget everything. Most of them don't live that long. Nine out of a 10 are slaughtered in their prime decades before their memories have started to drain. I speak of the majority then when I say it is true what you've heard, they never forget. They themselves think this accounts for their size. Some go so far as to claim that under that thunderhead of flesh and those huge rolling bones, they are memory. They contain memory, yes, but what may not be so well known is that they are doomed with it. When their memories begin to drain, their bodies go into decline as if from slow leakage of blood. But before then, every odor they have ever sucked into their trunks, every flicker of sunlight they have ever doused with their tremendous shadows is preserved inside them as a perfect and instantly retrievable moment. They rarely ask, do you remember? The remembering is taken for granted. It is the noticing they question. Did you smell that? Did you see it? Cool. So it's, it's really intriguing and I, they do a really good job. You know, all of the, uh, you know, there, there's unique names for each of the elephants. Everything is seen from their perspective again, just like the rabbits in there. And then the, she does a really good job of, uh, you know, pulling you into the story and really making you care about, you know, the elephants in this. So this, The White Bone by Barbara Gowdy, I would definitely, uh, definitely recommend if you're interested in some uncommon narrators. I have a good one. Um... We were looking for these. I couldn't believe this one. Um, Ian McEwen. Um, it's called Nutshell, and it is narrated by an unborn baby. Okay. So I just, it's like it's such a good premise. I can't believe it. Um, so I, the opening is just great. So I have to read this one. Um, so here I am, upside down in a woman, arms patiently crossed, waiting, waiting, and wondering who I'm in, what I'm in for. My eyes close nostalgically when I remember how I once drifted in my translucent body bag, floated dreamily in the bubble of my thoughts through my private ocean in slow motion somersaults, colliding gently against the transparent bounds of my confinement, the confiding membrane that vibrated with, even as it muffled, the voices of conspirators in a vile enterprise. That was in my careless youth, now fully inverted, not an inch of space to myself, knees crammed against my belly, my thoughts as well as my head are fully engaged. I have no choice. My ear is pressed all day and night against the bloody walls. I listen, make mental notes, and I'm troubled. I'm hearing pillow talk of deadly intent, and I'm terrified by what awaits me, by what might draw me in. <laughs> so you said that the unborn baby actually helps it's like a solve yeah, the murder or, mystery of yeah, there's uh, a the conspiracy plot out that's going on outside <laughs> of the womb. I just oh, like my heavens. come on. Well, from from the unborn child, we will go to a uh, short story. Uh, this is from the collection Tiny Deaths by Robert Schumann, who also wrote for uh, Doctor Who, as a matter of fact, and was known for some of his uh, sci-fi and speculative fiction uh, works. Um, this is, uh, and, and um, Michael had mentioned too that he said that the, the uncommon narrator uh, idea really lends itself to short stories because then that way you don't have to maintain it through an entire oh, novel. Thanks. So he said it's a very popular sort of way to, to uh, present short stories as well. So this is a short story collection, Tiny Deaths. Um, this one is about a uh, young girl who dies and is reincarnated as an ashtray. So um, I did see that... Um, so let me just uh, give you an idea of uh, Robert Sherman's uh, you know, take on, on this. So Natalie had not reached an age where she had had the cause to think about death very much. If the subject of an afterlife ever crossed her mind, it was only to wonder vaguely if heaven was where the hamster had gone. She had no particular desire to be reunited, reunited with the hamster, and so was less put out than most would be when she didn't go to heaven after all, but was instead reincarnated as an ashtray. There was a green marble ashtray in the living room. Once in a while, favored guests would be allowed to flick their ash into it. And at Natalie's birthday parties, it was used to hold peanuts or sweets. Most of the time, it served as a pretty enough ornament. It was the only ashtray in the house anyway, so Natalie presumed this was the one her soul now inhabited. She had no way to detect her greenness or her marbleness and only knew she was an ashtray in the first place because all the guests kept on grinding their cigarettes into her. Julie's mom was there too, grinding away, all dressed in black and looking ever so mournful. Natalie could tell she wasn't really mourning. No one but her parents were, but it was the right facial expression to wear at these sort of to-dos. Natalie didn't much like it with that all these strangers kept stubbing out burning sticks of tobacco into her distant relations, daddy's friends from work, people she'd never seen before and who really had no reason to care whether she were alive or dead. It wasn't that the stubbing hurt. She couldn't feel any physical sensation at all, no matter how hard she tried, but that the growing pile of butts blocked her already limited field of vision. She couldn't hear very much either. All the sounds seemed to come from a very long way away, and nothing was distinct unless the speaker was standing directly over her. But it wasn't as if anything she heard was especially interesting. She heard the phrase, sorry for your loss, so often it was nearly funny, but that was as good as it got. 
with nothing to see and nothing to listen to, Natalie drifted off to sleep. It had been a tiring day after all. <laughs> I, that might win. I think the so can of beans or the asher is pretty, <laughs> pretty close one. Um, I've got one, uh, the unbeatable squirrel girl, mouthful, squirrel meets world by Shannon Hale and Dean Hale. And there's three narrators, one of who is a squirrel, okay. which is pretty good. So um, this is the squirrel tippy toe. Um, <laughs> That's the squirrel's name? Uh, yes. Okay. It's really good. Um, See, see. Um, sorry, she'd said, humans never apologize to squirrels. They barely said sorry to each other. But this red-furred human girl with inexplicably, inexplicably strong haunches had apologized to me. And then there was that business with the delicious cashew in the metal box that I should have known was a trap. Inexcusable. When are there ever delicious cashews just lying around in metal boxes? Never. That's when. I'd been careless, distracted by the human girl business. And yet, she saved my life. Tore open that cage with her bare hands. Plus, she smelled a little like my dear departed mother. Mom always said folks were scared of things they didn't understand. And being scared of things is not something I do. I most certainly did not understand that girl, but I couldn't pretend it hadn't happened. I tailed her all the way to one of those large cages humans call homes before I came to my senses. I went to the park, killed a few acorn weevils, found a perfectly good half a sandwich inside a discarded plastic bag, turkey on rye. Whenever I get bird meat, I like to eat it in the open. Let those falcons and hawks see who the boss is. Me, I'm the boss. Oh, that's great. I know. <laughs> yeah, I do, we we do hope you enjoy these little like like story times as well because we we've talked about that's this in the really past fun. that it, it's fun for us and <laughs> and you know you don't always get you know people to read you books. I mean, audio books are a version of that, but I mean the whole we we stop reading books to our to our kids whenever they're really really little and then we don't have story times for adults that sort of thing. So it, it's um, you know let us know if you if you like that um, if you if you at least get a kick out of it. Um, but I think it's a really good way to convey little... the sound of a book, too, and literally the sound of a book. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, there were, um, we're uh, running out of time, but I did want to at least call attention to a couple of the other ones that I had brought. Yeah, um, there is the um, the Collector Collector by Tibor Fisher. Um, Nick and I just recently were talking about literary fiction for the Dublin Award mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And this is, I mean, um, Nick was saying, you know, that you, you know it when you see it. Okay, this is literary fiction. But it is uh, the one of the characters in it is an ancient bowl who, and then from what I can gather, the bowl is actually the collector collector because people collect the bowl, but of course the bowl collects the collectors. So so it's a you know it's like a thousand year old bowl and that sort of thing. So there's so there's that. Um, we also have uh, Me Cheetah, My Life in Hollywood. So this is the autobiography of Cheetah, the uh, chimpanzee that played in the, uh, the, the Tarzan movies. So he talks about his recollections with Johnny Weissmuller and all this kind of stuff. Um, I will say that the, uh, the, the Cheetah is a little foul mouth. So just to, uh, more, uh, more of those explicit lyrics there. So just to, just to be aware of that. And of course, we wouldn't be complete if we didn't bring up Animal Farm. So for those of you who have not read Animal Farm, you need to read this. Uh, it uh, was written in 1945, but it remains relevant right up to the present day. So I think that uh, it has a lot of things about you know, misinformation and conspiracies and you know, the, the totalitarianism and autocracy. So it's a very short book. It's been made into a number of different uh, film adaptations. Um, I just found out uh, before we started uh, on air today that Andy Serkis of uh, uh, Gollum fame and Planet of the Apes, and that is also working on an animated um, version of uh, Animal Farm. So that's uh, something to keep an eye on as well. But uh, this is sort of one of those ones where, again, uncommon narrators, uh, the animals have voices of their own, distinct personalities. Um, and it really seems to me that from all of these that we've been looking at, that um, if it's a good, if the person's a good storyteller, you can imbue whatever voice you want to, to to tell your story the way you want to tell it. So I think that's one of the one of the uh, things one of the takeaways from this. So a lot of interesting uh, ones to uh, to uh, share today. A lot of interesting voices from like you said from from cans of beans to you know unborn babies to demons to yeah. <laughs> we got a little bit of everything. And we didn't, you know, and we always just scratched the know, surface. Really so didn't. so. Uh, so if you do have any of uh, uh, books in this uh, voice that you uh, you like, uh, feel free to drop them in the uh, comments. And uh, we hope you enjoyed our little uh, 
tromp through uh, some uncommon narrator territory today. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us and we will uh, see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. <laughs>